Wow, here we are. Things are really heating up. We've seen the outer body of what projects and project managers are. Now it's time to look under the hood. As we discussed, each project is unique. The goal, the team with their own personalities, the time frame, and the circumstances all make a project its own entity. However, there is an established view on how each project evolves from start to finish. The Project Management Institute, which we mentioned in an earlier lesson, have determined five phases which characterize the development of a project. Let's have a look. The first process group is the initiation. This is where the project sponsor lays the foundations of the project. They will define the overall objective or concept or the problem which needs resolving. They will suggest a budget and a time frame and put all of this in the project business case. And, public service announcement for all aspiring project managers, this is also the phase where the project manager is chosen. Cool. The second phase is planning. This is the phase that can make or break a project. Good planning will increase the chances of completing a project within the project management triple constraints. You remember those, right? In the planning phase, the project manager needs to set the work and organize how the project team will execute it. They estimate and define resources and risks. Research is key. Here, the project manager must ask all the right questions and work with other project stakeholders to find the answers. They need to find out things like what activities need to be performed to create the deliverables and project scope, how much time should be given to each one of these activities, what is the required budget, what activities will each member of the project team do, and plenty more. Finally, the project manager must document all of these findings into a project management plan, the recipe for how to execute the work to achieve the goal. The better this recipe is, more comprehensive, detailed, realistic, the higher the project's chances of being a delicious success. Planning equals a strategy for winning. Then comes the execution phase. Finally, after all this intensive planning, the moment we've all been waiting for, the starting gun is fired. Ready, set, go the project team starts creating the deliverables. If the project is construction related, this is when the team starts building. If it's a software development project, this is when they start coding and programming. You get the point. It's here in the execution phase where the project manager ensures the smooth running of the project, motivating the team and resolving any issues that crop up. Next, we have monitoring and control. Beware though, it does not start after execution. This phase runs in parallel to it. The project manager performs monitoring and control activities they have developed to track the progress of the project streams and ask, is the execution progressing as per the plan we created? Is the speed and quality in line with the time frame? Are the expenses within the budget? If not, if there are delays, slowdowns or gaps, the project manager must identify them and take action to fix them before it's too late. Lastly, the closure phase. When all the project work is done, the project manager still has some final tasks to do to formally complete the project. They must hand the project over to whomever it was designed for. The sponsor must officially approve and sign off the project, confirming the agreed objective has been achieved. Then, the project team, the stakeholders, and the project manager sit and discuss the lessons learned. What went well, what didn't, and what could be improved for future projects. Continuous improvement is important, which is why project managers must constantly learn new skills and build on their expertise. Once the feedback is documented, the process is complete, and everyone involved can have a little bit of rest until the next project begins. Wow, what a life project managers have. And I know, you know, what's coming next. That's right, 
an in-depth look into each process group of the project's lifecycle. Next lesson, we start with the initiation phase. See you there. So, let's begin with the first stage of our project, the initiation phase. This phase starts with an idea or an organisational need such as the ones we discussed before. And this forward-thinking person or persons who addresses this need is the project sponsor. Their responsibility is to determine if a project can even be executed. Does the organisation have the available resources? Will the project deliver the expected benefits? They are also in charge of taking on board arguably the most important person in the project, the project manager. It's important to note that the project manager can be appointed at any time throughout this phase and will have to catch up with the project as soon as he or she is on board. And although the project manager can work to help the sponsor in building the project fundamentals and promoting it to the management for approval, they are not considered responsible for the tasks we will be discussing. The project manager's time to shine is with the planning stage, which we get to later. So, imagine, in your city, there's a brand new retail park opening. All the big names are launching branches there and the buzz surrounding the whole thing is extraordinary. Head marketing manager for super awesome car manufacturer Lamborari has seen a market need to keep up with the competition and take advantage of this trendy new area. So they want to start a project to address this. Now, not every project survives the initiation phase, but they are all born from a need. Over the next few lessons, we will take you through six aspects of the initiation phase that a potential project must survive. In this lesson, we're going to look at how the goal of the project is defined, and how a clear, sensible objective is essential to having a project. So what is our goal? A project needs a goal. We need to know where we're going. On top of this, we must ask, does achieving the goal even require a project? Remember the definition of a project. A project is a temporary initiative and is agreed, planned and executed to achieve a specific goal. The initiative is complex. It delivers benefit to the organisation and fits its strategy. If Jenny from accounting is on maternity leave, it is the accounting department's duty to cover her work or hire a temp. It does not require a project. Sometimes management will try to label simple tasks as projects when they are not. But these do not survive initiation. However, what about our market need that must be addressed? What if our goal was to have a new top-of-the-range showroom in a new retail park, showcasing our newest, most state-of-the-art cars with well-trained staff and setting the standard in terms of showroom architecture? Does this require a project? Well, the initiative is temporary, it will have limited resources, it's complex, benefits the business and fits their strategy of becoming the biggest car company in the world. Sounds like an exciting potential project to me. So let's put together a business case to get it approved. Join us in the next lesson where we will be doing this. So. Our goal is worthy of a project, but what's the next step? Remember the project selection and project portfolio management mentioned before, where the board of directors choose the projects that are worth the organization's time and resources? This is where the business case comes in. Its job is to convince the board of directors to invest company resources in this project, not somebody else's. Let's take our showroom example. To prove its worth, the business case must adhere to established standards. First, we must explain the project's purpose for the business. It will increase revenue, as the new retail park is sure to be a landmark in the city for consumers looking for top-of-the-range products, and it will increase brand awareness as it will get a lot of exposure. Then, costs and potential gains. In the business case, you will see all the numbers and financial analysis. In our example, 
a showroom is a big investment. We must give a detailed financial analysis. All costs and potential gains will need to be carefully estimated and all financial elements must be described. Revenues, expenses, expected inflation, discounted cash flow if we're talking multi-million dollar projects, interest rates, taxes, and this is the time the net present value and payback methods will be applied, which we discussed in the additional materials from section 1. But don't stress too much. This is for the project sponsor and senior leaders to prepare. However, if the business case is approved, this often serves as the official sign-off to start the project. Hurrah! We've got the go-ahead. We have a project. But you see, it's one thing having a project, it's another knowing exactly what's involved in that project. So next lesson, we'll be looking at the scope of our project. See you there. So, remember we spoke about scope at the beginning of the course? Project managers are great at seeing the scope of things, and they will go into great detail during the planning stage. However, at this point, the project sponsor will still need an idea of everything that's involved in our project. Everything that needs to be done for our goal to be achieved. But what exactly is part of our scope? Should the heating in the showroom be electric or gas? This question is within our scope. Should the local newspaper write an opinion piece on how showrooms are a thing of the past? Definitely not part of our scope. When should the showroom's details be updated to the company website? Hmm, is this within our scope or somebody else's? It's not always clear where questions may come up and disrupt progress. A so-called grey area, where the team may be unsure whether something is part of the project. So, the sponsor works with the project team and the project manager, if they've been appointed, to try and predict where these grey areas may occur, and confirm any doubts. Speaking of hiring, the project team are experts from production, IT, resource and development, HR, supply chain, etc. The project manager and sponsor use the team's expertise to their advantage, especially when defining the scope. They can be outsourced by the project manager or sponsor or already be part of the organisation. As for the project manager, the stakeholders choose one, but that project manager is not obliged to say yes to their offer. Accountability is a big commitment. Therefore, any prospective project manager scrutinises the information gathered in the initiation. They do not run from a challenge, but they will demonstrate if something is unrealistic. Say Finland is hosting the World Cup and want to build a hotel for the players of visiting countries next to the main stadium. They have sufficient budget and the business case has been approved. The project manager comes in and reviews the information the sponsor has put together and concludes there is no way construction can finish within the 12 months before the tournament starts. Therefore, he or she declines the project. This is the best outcome for everybody, as the organisation knows not to waste resources on a project that will serve them no benefit, and instead finds other means to achieve the desired goal, like booking an entire already built hotel for the duration of the tournament. One way a project sponsor will assess whether a project is realistic is through a feasibility study, which we will discuss in the next lesson. See you there. So the business case has detailed all your finances. The scope is a guide to what your project will involve. And now it's time for a feasibility study. And it's just what it sounds like. An analysis of the goals, scope and resources to determine whether the success of the project is feasible. Oh, and bear in mind the feasibility study is on a mid to high level. The project sponsor and project manager need to move efficiently through the initiation and the analysis should be just enough to confirm they can go ahead with the time, budget and resources available. But don't worry. A more detailed analysis and preparation of resources is performed during the planning phase. For now though, the project sponsor must ask, can the organisation provide the needed budget, time, employees and management attention so the project can be executed? 
Do they possess the needed expertise? For example, engineering, coaching, project management, IT, and so on. Or do partner companies need to be involved? If so, which ones and how best to procure them? For example, Lamborari need to provide us with managers from other showrooms to train new ones. HR need to assign people to the hiring of staff. Their marketing team needs extra resources to advertise and they need to hire out contractors for the building work. There are many fields that go into executing a project and we will have to consider them all and how they interconnect. For our project to go ahead, we need to get all the information we need. Is our project feasible? It's a simple question with a not so simple process. Let's assume we have a positive answer to the above question. So let's get into risk assessment and expectations next. Another important task when preparing to take on a project. I'll see you there. The project is feasible. The organization has the resources needed to execute the project. But what about the things unseen? To use an analogy, the first thing to do when entering a dark room is to find the light switch. In project management terms, this means reveal the risks. The way we deal with uncertainty will undoubtedly affect whether the project is a success. Or will we turn the lights back off and hope for the best? Risks must be identified, analysed and responded to. Although we will go into way more detail during the planning phase, as will the project manager. But for now, one area that needs to be addressed is everyone's expectations. Does everybody share the same vision as each other? Are they expecting the same resources? Who does everyone think is ultimately accountable? Let's go back to our project example. Perhaps one of our stakeholders imagines our showroom to be targeted towards families, so wants more saloon cars to be showcased, while another knows that luxury sports cars sell very well in this part of the city, so expects more of the cars to be two-door convertibles. Or maybe the sponsor believes the hiring of staff is outside of the project scope, while the stakeholders believe the project is not complete until the showroom is physically open for business. We must spend time with stakeholders, looking at the project in development from every angle to see if there is something that looks different to someone else. The sooner they can find and resolve expectation gaps, the better. Overlooking these expectations can have disastrous results. Okay, so now we've done our preliminary checks. And of course, during the planning phase, we will go into much more detail. But before the initiation phase can be closed, a project charter has to be created. A neat, high-level document detailing everything done in the initiation. See you in the next lesson. Assuming the project is still viable, and the team are super enthused to get this train on the tracks, we need to give it a passport. Otherwise, it'll be stopped at every border and questioned extensively. What a waste of time. The passport is the project charter, and it's a high level document, meaning it's easy and quick to understand, remember, and must contain all the fundamental information about the project. This is usually put together by the project owner. Here's an example of a charter. The sections that must be included in the charter are the project ID, the name of the project, the name of the organization. Sometimes a number is added to a project as an ID, especially useful for programs with many projects. This is it. Then, project description. Here we have the goal, the reason for doing the project. After that, project objectives. What's going to happen during the project? The timeline and milestones are also added. The project scope is more key information that can be seen here. 
says what is covered by the project. Here we have a list of key stakeholders, clients, sponsors, and the project manager. Why are they involved and how are they impacted? Also include a section for the main risks and how to prepare for them. And then budget. What are the constraints and who grants the finances? You can also add the business case as an attachment if need be. What's important when creating a project charter is to not make it too technical. It's for ease of reference, so anyone can look at it, find what they need, and move on. If what they need is more details, the charter will show them exactly where to look. Efficient, right? Here, you can find a template. They shouldn't exceed a page or two. And of course, different projects may include additional sections if relevant to the project. However, what I have mentioned is the bread and butter of a project charter. Well, there we go. Initiation phase complete. All right, everyone, to recap. The initiation phase is all about evaluation and approval. The analyses here are generally high level, but in no way unimportant. This is the foundation for the entire project. It sets the overall vision and direction. One last thing to remember before we move on. The project manager can technically be appointed at any time during the initiation phase, even right at the end, after the charter has been written up. So don't take this as a definitive chronological order, but you can be sure that the project will not move to the planning phase until the project manager has gone over everything. So what goes on in the planning phase? Join us in the next lesson to find out. See you there. Lamborari is a car manufacturing company specializing in the luxury segment with small stylish cars. It is a mid-sized company with a remarkable history. The first Lamborari was produced more than 60 years ago. One of the main strengths of the company is the engineering division. Customers that acquire a Lamborari are very satisfied, praising how comfortable the cars are, how good the driving experience is, and how durable the product. Repairs are quite rare, compared to other automobiles from the same class. Of course, as anything in business, there is a trade-off. The cars are expensive. In recent years, Lamborari has observed a decline in their sales. Considering the great customer satisfaction, the main reason is the extremely competitive market and entrance of new players. The decreasing sales and revenue trend is concerning, and the top management organise a three-day business trip to focus on the issue and decide what to do before it's too late. Considering the issue is with sales, the responsibility falls on the sales manager, Sonia, to lead the sessions. After the brainstorming session, the management team has selected two initiatives to bring the sales back up and growing again. The first is an advertising campaign, in partnership with a leading tour agency, focused on the high-end market segment. The company organises trips to exotic destinations such as the Maldives, Seychelles, Caribbean Sea and South America, offering a five-star experience. As you can imagine, most of the customers are wealthy, which fits into Lamborari's target groups, a good place to work on the marketing to expand sales. The second initiative is to build a showroom in a trendy area of New York City where the company can organise exhibitions of the new models that are to be released in late 2020. There, the company would showcase state-of-the-art automotive technology wrapped in a captivating design. The goal is to present this to the end customer in an interactive and engaging way. The showroom will be equipped with the latest visualisation technology, including an augmented reality application 
which will allow the users to experience the cars in a completely new and appealing way. It's October 2019, and Sonia, as key responsible, starts working on initiating the strategic projects. For a few weeks, they go through a feasibility study, estimating the high-level budget needed and reviewing the key risks. Finally, the project charter is created and presented to the CEO. Everything looks good, and the CEO approves the project to go forward. Sonia is named project sponsor. Great. The most important thing for the sales manager is to identify who can lead the projects, especially the second one. The company has been doing various advertisement campaigns, but never something like the showroom. On the way back home, while driving her red Lamborghini, Sonia thinks of the last few projects and remembers there was a young and very motivated business analyst from the finance department who excelled on all project activities assigned to her. She even led a project work stream independently and reached a great result. What was her name? Ah, Ray. First thing the next morning, Sonia goes to have a quick chat with Ray. She explains the project that is about to start and asks if she would potentially be interested in taking the role of project manager. Ray can't believe it. She always wanted to manage projects. She has participated in various ones, but never as a project manager. That was the reaction Sonia expected. To formalise the assignment, an approval from Ray's manager will be needed. They are, however, on vacation, returning next week. In order to best use the time, Sonia suggests that Ray look through the project information and draft some ideas on how she would execute the project. Ray keeps her fingers crossed that her manager will approve. It is such a great career opportunity. She decides to make the most of the next few days and focuses on the tasks until the end of the week. Sonia has sent her the project charter with a business case and other supporting materials attached. Ray decides to go through the objective and main activities listed in the scope. Exciting idea. Showroom. Cars. Fancy gadgets. The showroom is supposed to engage the potential buyers by showing them a completely new perspective of interacting with the shiny new Lamborghinis. In addition to all the cars on display, visitors will be able to play around with the Lamborghini's brand new augmented reality app, running on tablets available on location. The app would use the device's cameras to automatically detect the new car models when pointed at them and would give the possibility to change the colour, rims and body type of the car, or to see the engine in x-ray mode and even to design their own custom exterior paintwork. And all of this in real time. As a follow-up, customers will be able to take home any customised model they create by simply entering their email address into the application. This, in turn, gives Lamborghini a natural sales entry point to reach more potential users. Ray thinks, I will try to imagine how to execute the project. Okay, it's October now. The opening is planned for next August. Sounds like plenty of time. Let's see the activities. Ray goes one by one, drawing on her notebook as she thinks. Car manufacturing. Okay, that should not be very difficult. We are a car company. One or two months must be enough. Developing the AR application. Hmm. I have participated in the website upgrade last year. We did fancy things. But it was not very easy. We had to coordinate various experts, marketing, sales, web developers, and finally the management to approve, but I think I know how to work in such an environment. Hmm, wait a second. I know the montaging of visual effects systems in the exhibition spaces will take quite some time. And they need to be montaged somewhere right? So the showroom must be constructed before the vendor can deploy and test the new system. That complicates the work. 
when will the construction be ready? Oh, did I say construction? Yikes. That's right, we need to execute construction. She is struck with complete fear. I have no experience with that. It's something that requires engineers and architects. I don't have any engineering background. Wait a second. That's even worse. Ten months to August? I remember my friend's family moved to a new building. The construction took more than two years. How can we do it in ten months? Oh, it will actually be less because we have no construction company hired yet. Oh, I don't think I'm the person for this project. I lack this knowledge and it seems impossible to me. Ray continues. Staff hiring. About ten employees need to be recruited to run the showroom. I have never interviewed anyone. How can I manage that? I'm not qualified. I'm so disappointed. I really wanted to become a project manager, but I don't have the needed expertise. Construction? HR? Oh. She becomes sad. And the following day, she meets with Sonia. Sonia brings great news with her. Ray's manager has agreed to allocate her for the next ten months to take on the project. However, Ray isn't reacting as Sonia would expect. She seems sad. Sonia asks, what's wrong? Ray explains that with great regret she cannot be a project manager for this project. She explains what she analysed and that she clearly lacks engineering skills, HR skills and so on. Sonia then does the strangest thing. She laughs and says, You are very wrong. You will be the project manager and you have the needed skills. Ray is simultaneously confused, surprised and slightly happier. But how? Sonia continues, Well, the role of project manager is to be able to manage any type of work with the help of experts in each field. Do you think the construction engineer can manage HR and software visual effects pieces? Or the HR expert managing the construction? A good project manager has to learn quickly and adapt, but be an expert in only one thing. Project management. Ray is still confused. Sonia asks, Do you have software development background? Ray answers, No. I graduated in business administration. Nevertheless, you managed the website upgrade work stream last year and did pretty well, Sonia exclaims. Ray admits, Well, yes, I learned many things. It went well. Of course it went well, Sonia smiles. You demonstrated you're a quick learner, very motivated and a great collaborator. You help the different experts work together to achieve the common goal. And that's what you will do now. The long-gone feeling of self-confidence starts coming back to Ray. But still, construction is so new. She asks Sonia for some more information. Sonia explains that a vendor has already been selected. Ray will need to get in touch and agree the starting date. Ray asks, But is it possible, at all, to create a building from scratch in less than ten months? My friends bought a new apartment. Sonia interrupts. This is a good concern of yours, Ray. It shows you are doing a feasibility check. I have done this as a project sponsor. As we are building a one-story building, the vendor confirmed this can be created on time. But you will need to work on the exact details with their representative. Ray lets out a sigh of relief. Oh, okay, that seems better now. And with recruitment, I guess I would seek the HR department for help. Sonia nods approvingly. As for the cars, oh, I'm not worried at all, it should be fine. Sonia's face drops to a serious one. Uh, what? Ray puzzles. Ray. Don't underestimate that. There are six cars to be manufactured, and these are brand new models. 
with new features and designs, anything could go wrong. Let me forward an email to you on that topic. We had a session to agree the specifics with the head of manufacturing and the marketing manager. These notes will be useful to you. Ray gets a bit stressed again. Sonia is right. How could she have overlooked that? Sonia smiles again. Ray, don't worry. I know there are many questions, and your experience with projects is limited, but I will not let you go into this adventure unprepared. I have subscribed you to the 365 Project Management course. It will start from zero and slowly walk you through all the things a project manager has to do in any project. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Sonia. This is exactly what I need to learn the fundamentals and connect it with the experience I have so far. No problems, Sonia says. Good luck with the preparation, and I'll see you at the kickoff meeting. Ray again is baffled. What is a kickoff, and when is it taking place? Sonia smiles once more. You will have to answer that question, dear project manager. Ray takes a deep breath. Okay. I must keep the dark side of my thoughts away and stay positive. Let's start learning about project management. And now, let's join Ray and start learning the very best practices in project management to see what the most common errors are and how to eliminate them. See you there.